And now, for our feature presentation. Are you ready? Streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. Hey, what a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've already had two glasses, too, of Tennessee whiskey. Jay, we've done, you've done so good, and you have to muck it up right at the end. <laughs> Jay's gray. He's all gray now. Look at his beard. <laughs> I, mean, I got grayer, right? Uh, everyone in the chat, thanks for stopping by and join yourselves. We know you did. Just get three <laughs> here with us. Tonight, we get to hang out with horror writer KC Griffiths. Welcome to the show. We got to stop taking so much time off in between shows because I keep forgetting how to. <laughs> I had to make the intro. Off. Yeah, yeah. I remember putting that intro together earlier this week. I'm like, where, where, where did I save everything? I don't know. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to a new edition of Paper Cuts. Happy Friday! The only place to be on a Friday evening, right here. I'm Jay. That's Brad over there tonight. Special guest. But before I introduce her, I was told um, by Rebecca Rowland, friend of the show, <laughs> I need to be on my best behavior. <laughs> and she also said that this guest is smart as fuck. Okay, so just throwing that out well, there. You're already out of luck, then, James. You're already out. Yeah. Of luck. <laughs> you may be the smartest person that we've ever had on the show. Um, <laughs> Casey Griffin's here with us this evening. Casey, thanks so much for uh, you know agreeing to to come on with two bozos with the microphones here. We appreciate it. <laughs> thanks for having me. I'm excited. What are you normally doing on the? Well, it's it's early for you still out there on on the West Coast, right? That's right. Yeah. So are, are we inter- evening evening instead of night. Yeah. So we're interrupting dinner. I'm guessing, or you know, usually it's sort of a frantic mad rush from the day <laughs> job to daycare pickup and wrangling mm. two small children and dinner time and bedtime. So my husband's taking care of that tonight. I'm very. Oh, they're, they're not running around behind you right now. Not yet. Not okay. yet. I locked the door, so hopefully, hopefully yeah. we're good. <laughs> I forgot to lock get, the door one episode, and my daughter came in here and was like, you got to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good at that. yeah. So what's on the uh, agenda for dinner tonight when you get off the air with us? Oh, Costco meatloaf. Okay. Good okay. go-to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what's the weather like right now out there in California? I, I don't hot. know why I'm talking about the weather, but still. <laughs> it's hot in San Diego. <laughs> Okay. It's, um, yeah, upper 80s. It's kind of uncomfortable. So yeah, unless you're going see. to the pool or beach, right? It's um, yeah, toasty out there. Are you close to the beach? You have a view of the beach, or are you? Um, you know, maybe with binoculars on a clear day. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's about 20 minutes from here, so not not too far. That's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Idiot. I would totally take 80 degree weather right now. It's like 100 and humid in Kentucky. Oh. Ooh, yeah. I think tomorrow and Sunday we're going to have a little dip. Maybe at least up here in Ohio. So that means yard work for me. So, <laughs> oh, well, the thing about here is it stays hot through October, and I grew up on the East Coast, so I'm used to October being you know fall foliage. But here right. it's very hot in October. So I found out the first year I moved here, you can't carve a pumpkin and leave it out for weeks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. It's like fast forward. Yeah. Okay. So you were on the East Coast and you made your way to West, just what okay. to become a movie star or something, or so what people <laughs> go to California for? <laughs> Goodness, no. No, I moved out about 10 years ago for a job in um, science communications. And I'd always oh. wanted to live on the West Coast. I grew up on the East Coast, Delaware, Boston, New York. And I don't know, the winters really got me down when I was in Boston. I love the city, but it's a little too intense. So mm-hmm. I'm streaming of California and finally made my way out here. It's been great. Now I, I promise we're gonna get to your writing, your books and all, but science communication, what it's smart gotta, stuff, Joe. Just don't ask about it. It's I gotta know stuff. about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um so I got a degree in science journalism, which is journalism but right. covering yeah. science, right? So it's a, a specialty beat. And then science communications is a little broader where you basically translate scientific findings, scientific papers to the lay audience. So in press releases, magazine articles, uh, news articles, podcasts, that sort of thing. 
Um, so it's really fun because I get to talk to scientists and help them tell their stories of discovery, but I'm not stuck in a lab kind of you know, right. doing the mundane lab work. So it's a good, it's been a good fit for me. Right. Well, because I hear the communication part, I have a communication background where I worked in uh, broadcasting. So, but my communication was, you know, making jokes on the air and radio, <laughs> stuff like that. Nothing to do with science. You know, I was introducing bands and interviewing people and, but yeah, science, I, that would, that would have been weird for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you may be the smartest person we've ever had on the show. Just FYI. I get that, but uh, thank so, you. so you do, so you do writing in your day job, science writing in your day job. Yeah. It's a lot more editing now and kind of overseeing okay. writers. Um, but I try to jump back in and do some writing here and there when I can. So do, when you get off work, you know, for your, your personal writing, do you ever just feel like exhausted? You don't want to write anything ever? No, it's the it opposite. It's the opposite. opposite. It's at work, it's all about like collaborative writing, you know, layers of reviews, and it's nonfiction writing, right? So it's very different. Mm -hmm. Whereas fiction is really the only facet of my life where I have full control, right? It's my reality. I can do whatever I want. I don't need approval. Uh, so it's it's a really nice contrast. Do you ever mix the two on accident and put some of your non, some of your fictional stuff into your nonfiction? Like a scientist got murdered by a monster or something, and it, you know, the opposite, right? Like I've definitely <laughs> yeah. had scientific discoveries inspire like sci-fi horror stories, uh, but I haven't slipped the other way. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I guess that would probably cost your job, maybe. It's like Casey, hey, we got this uh, scientific journal here, but. This monster Pretty doesn't much. exist. Where'd you get this from? You know? <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about your, your new collection. Is it out yet or does it come out tomorrow? Yeah, no, it's out. It came out on um, July 11th, 7 11. Okay. So I was way off. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Shrouded so, Horror. Shrouded Horror. Yeah, Tales yeah. of the Uncanny. I love the title. Thank you. Here's the cover. Here we, oh. You can see it. There we go by um, Carrion House, Luke Spooner. He does an amazing job with um, horror art. So I was super happy with how the cover turned out. Yeah, we've seen quite a few of uh, the covers, yeah. Mm. He's Sounds one of like, my favorite cover, cover artists. Yeah, anytime you say that name of the, of the title, there needs to be like an echo. Hey, that's what it horror, <laughs> yeah. tells of the uncanny. Ooh, like that. So how, did you, how did you hook up with uh, Luke Spooner to do your cover. Was that part of like through the, the press did that or? Yeah, well, I actually requested him because he did the cover okay. of my first book, which is um, Melinda West, Monster Gunslinger. Okay. And uh, he just nailed it. You know, he's so great. So oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, I didn't realize he did that one. Yeah, I, he's so versatile. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, he does amazing covers. And but for both of them, he just he nailed it the first time I saw the cover and it was perfect. So um, yeah, super happy with that. And that's one of the nice things about working with small press. I could request mm -hmm. him right. And they're, right. they're happy to accommodate. I'm always curious how much sort of um, input authors have in their cover. So did you all go back and forth and you say, I want, you know, these monsters from the stories in there or, just kind of giving broad strokes and he kind of what might made up of on his own? Yeah, a little bit of both. So I, um, for Melinda West, I didn't give any direction and I love how he um, conceptualized the cover. I gave some minor tweaks like around the fonts and the spiders needed to be adjusted. So really minor stuff. For the second one, Shrouded Horror, I actually looked at some examples I liked and um, I just had this concept of a human figure with monsters behind them. And right. I'd mm -hmm. seen some artwork of Lovecraft with that, where he's kind of just his okay, monster yeah. following him. Yeah. Right. So I sent that as inspiration and then described a few of the key monsters and um, he nailed it. So Was the Melinda West. That, Go ahead, Jay. Melinda West, that, that's uh, considered what, like a weird Western kind of? Yeah, weird that, Western. That's, yes. that's a novel, it's, right? It's a novel. It's okay. horror, fantasy, um, standalone series. The second one is coming out next year. Right. Uh, okay. So that's, that and then Shroud of Horror is your uh, collection. Horror collection. collection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure, so you're sure. so you're at both ends uh, of the spectrum. There, you got a novel, now short stories, mm -hmm. any kind of uh, 
novellas in between that we're going to find from you? Or? You know, I actually, I am just starting to shop a novella, which is haunted B&B, New England B&B. It's, I describe it as a crossover between Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Haunting of Hill House. Okay. Nice. Started shopping it, so fingers crossed. Was it was it hard for you to pick which monsters you wanted on the cover from all the different stories you had? Um, you know, some of them I thought would be a little easier to see um, visually, right? Whereas others were a little mm -hmm. more kind of in your head, ghost-like. Uh, so I wasn't sure how some of the more abstract ones would turn out, but he did a great job. I liked how you, you didn't just do, you know, like, I don't want to say generic, but like the common one, a vampire or a werewolf, you kind of, in a lot of the stories, you created kind of your own monsters. So is that something you like to do? It's just kind of the conceptualization of creating mm -hmm. your own monster or cryptid or creature, whatever it is. Yeah. I love creating new monsters, usually by kind of remixing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think a lot of writers we like to do this is think about the trope of the monster and an interesting twist that you can put on it. Um, and then the other place I get inspiration for cryptids is just nature, right? There's a lot of really strange animals out there um, in the ocean, insects. So I use a lot of those and kind of mix and match, especially for the weird Western where they're monster exterminators. So they're mm -hmm. hunting like all kinds of monsters that have come up from this um, gap in the earth that kind of disrupted the old west. When you do that, do you, are you a visual kind of what thing when you do that? Like, oh, here's part of a bat and I'm going to stick it on insect legs or is it just all in your imagination? I would say a combination. Um, it usually takes a few times of refining to like get the visuals mm -hmm. right where a reader can say, okay, I can really picture this. Um, yeah, and actually for the second Melinda West book, I'll have a map in the beginning. And for the map, she oh, okay. sketched a few of the monsters, like a field guide. So I'm really excited for that. Oh, that's cool. I love maps. Maps in a book's like yeah. instant buy for me. Just, I don't right. care what the rest of it about. Just having the map at the beginning is super cool. Yeah, I'm very excited for that. So when you're doing, like creating these monsters, do you, and maybe it works both ways. Do you ever just... Uh, create a monster in your head, but, and then try to work a story around it or have mm. the story go on and then try to, you know, let's see what kind of monster we can fit in here. Yeah, I would say probably both for the short stories. Some of them start with the inkling of a monster. Um, mm -hmm. And then other ones, it's sort of following the characters in a strange situation and then thinking of what would be like a really weird creature for them to encounter here, what would you know make sense given their environment? Um, so, for example, in one story called Vermin in the short story collection, um, these kids are waiting for pizza. They end up taking this yeah. toy <laughs> gun for a shortcut, and they encounter basically a city vermin, but kind of a, a remixed monstrous version, like rat bats, right? Uh, right. With yeah. Face of the flesh. I like that one a lot. I think that's the first story in the, the yeah, collection, if I'm right. not mistaken. Yeah. I don't know. That one reminded me of just the beginning part where they're encountering the vermin of whatever the Stephen King movie is, where they're like working in the factory and have to clean out all the, the rats and the bats in the basement. I can't remember. I think it's called Night Shift. Yeah, it's part, part of Night Shift, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Uh, I, I just got the vibes from that when they're going through the, the uh, like alleyway and yeah. having all the rats and stuff. I'm, I'm not a big fan of... Uh... Rats and, 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 and rats and snakes and that that kind of uh, material, but I made it through the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in the um, in the in introduction to the collection, you're talking about your inspirations being like Goosebumps and mm -hmm. like Tales from the Crypt and Twilight Zone. So how did the, how did those influence you in this particular collection, at least? Yeah, I think. Um... So for a lot of short stories, I really try to have a little twist at then as much as possible. And I think that, you know, Goosebumps is great at that. Um, Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt, right? They'll show you something creepy, but then often have a little twist at the end, which I yeah. love. So that is kind of what I'm always striving for. And they, not all stories work out that way, but um, that's usually my goal. So some of them will have that little twist at the end. 
Um, but yeah, growing up, you know, I didn't love super graphic, gory horror, like serial killers, that sort of thing. I really right. like supernatural, especially monsters, um, any mm -hmm. kind of sci-fi horror. I just, I just loved and consumed a lot of that. I got a little bit of a Black Mirror feel. I don't know if you've watched Black Mirror from yeah. Netflix, but at times. And, and one thing I noticed too, a lot of the stories uh, it left the ending to the reader's imagination. You didn't just spell out and wrap yeah. up and tie all the loose ends, you know, for the end of it. Like they lived happily ever after without their heads or whatever. <laughs> you know, you, there are a couple of times you ended it and like, oh, it made me think, wonder what the hell happened next you know so that's, that's pretty cool that's that's where that that, that black mirror and twilight Ooh. zone feel came in for me because that's what they always did that made you wonder after the story too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so do you have do you, this is like asking your favorite kid do you have a favorite story from the collection <laughs> you know it's really hard to say and i was asked to read a story yesterday and I ended mm -hmm. up reading just another apocalypse because a lot of people seem to really like that one. Um, but uh, people interpreted it very differently. So I don't know if that one's my problem child, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's, I, it's interesting where I, I like that one a lot, but I see people interpret the ending very differently uh, than mm -hmm. what I intended, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? If people are enjoying yeah. it, but it sort of puzzles me as an author, like, oh, I guess, you know, I, I never thought to interpret it this way. Um, so I guess that's probably one of my favorites. It is hard to pick. It, they are like children, right? Some kind of depends on your mood. Are you in the mood for like more quiet, pensive time with this child or kind of a rowdier adventure with this child? um so yeah i don't know if i can pick one <laughs> the that one is the the zombie one right Where that's right balloons to the zombies yeah i liked your take on zombies on that one because they were just completely mindless they had some sort of consciousness to them still mm -hmm. which i thought was interesting yeah with the the major twist at the end of it so when you hear them interpret the ending different than what you mm -hmm. meant she's like, you ever, she's like you ever wrong. tell them <laughs> <laughs> um i don't because i don't know that it's a wrong interpretation right like right. some stories mm -hmm. you can interpret them differently than what the author intended and it doesn't make it you know better or worse it's just kind of interesting like in mm -hmm. my head i think it's really clear i i thought i left like the clues so that the ending is clear but it's just fascinating um to see the different interpretations and as a creator like wondering okay is this a good thing is this a bad thing I will say with that one, I was not expecting the way the ending went with that particular mm -hmm. story. Good. Which, good. which was good because <laughs> yeah. it's it's boring if you're like can predict everything. So to get caught yeah. off guard is I think it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's um I mean, I think the I think what really resonates with people is kind of that feeling of, you know, these endless disasters that we're constantly hearing about and just feeling really kind of numb uh, to the mm -hmm. latest apocalypse, so to say, whether it's pandemic or political. Um, and then these characters are, you know, in their early twenties. So they're just faced with this world with no hope. Uh, so I think, I think that is probably what resonates a lot with readers. Mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I like the, the different sort of take, I think maybe Romero did it once where like the zombies would drive cars or whatever, but, very mm -hmm. different take on on the zombies where they're like i said they're not just completely mindless they these are highly talk sophisticated a little bit. zombies okay yeah you still got a suit the on zombie and... elite their peak is in the air when they drink so <laughs> they're they drink your blood yeah <laughs> so here if you remember because i know a lot of authors they won't remember kind of where their ideas came from but like with that particular story was it your intention going in to have uh, like a different sort of zombie than just you know what we normally see uh, it sort of, it started with the image of the zombies with balloons. Um, mm -hmm. So just kind of free flowing from there and then thinking, well, what can I do for me that's different and would be interesting for me to read, you know, regarding mm -hmm. zombies. Um, so a lot of my short stories start with an image, something I just see online um, and then just kind of brainstorm from there and try to get a story like out of myself within a day or two. 
is mm -hmm. I find a really helpful exercise. So I would say the majority of stories in that collection had some sort of image inspiration. Okay. It, it really kind of shows that zombies have evolved over the, <laughs> over the <laughs> what, 50, 60 years or so, you know, from the early zombie movies to the way they are now, they're like, they're, I could be a zombie and you wouldn't know it until you know, <laughs> I kill you. Until it's too late. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, I'm highly sophisticated zombie or anything, but still, <laughs> you know, but it just sees like, that's, that's one, that's one uh, genre. I guess you could say that I've seen change so much over the year, R the original zombies slow moving and couldn't mm -hmm. talk or anything. And they just, you know, but now you see movies where they're like running fast and, carrying on conversations and they're intelligent and all this stuff so when there was a zombie love movie like i heart zombie or something that's like what i'm that. trying to think of where they, oh, like, yeah. they actually had conversations and stuff it was yeah. like the twilight version but with zombies in it like i remember that yeah <laughs> and it was from the zombies perspective which was right different. it was called like was it warm bodies or something like that maybe? yeah warm yeah. bodies i didn't have a question but i just was went off on one of my tangents <laughs> <I apologize. laughs> it's a good topic yeah so with with the with the collection did you have like an overall theme you were wanting sort of all the stories to kind of hit and gel together with? Yeah, it's, um, I tried to capture it in the title of shrouded horror. So sort of these horrors that lie on the edges of reality. Um, mm -hmm. so the initial thought was, okay, here's kind of everyday situations and people for the most part, some are near future, but in general, here's like a person and they're about to encounter something really, you know, terrible or monstrous that's sort of just lingering on the edge of reality. <clears throat> so that was the very loose theme. And um, I selected stories that I thought sort of fit that, even though some are sci-fi. Um, mm -hmm. But generally, you know, here's, yeah, any of us could be in this situation. And, you know, what would you do if you encountered this creature or monster? Mm -hmm. Are these all new stories or have these been in like magazines and podcast it's a mix okay. i would say um probably a little more than half have been published in magazines or podcasts or anthologies okay. um and then some are original to the collection we say podcast is like the uh i can't think what it's called you write it and like someone narrates it is that what you mean yeah so um pseudopod uh the okay. horror podcast they actually did just another apocalypse a few months ago and they did a great job okay. um Slayhouse uh publishing they did a full like production of um u train which features mm -hmm. four characters stuck in this uh okay. subway stop where the subway never comes so they got different voice actors for each one that one messed with my mind a little bit by the way <laughs> but that that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah they that's did cool. a great job so did you have much input in that, like as far as like voice actors and all that stuff? No. Or they just did their own thing? Yeah, did their own thing. Um, same with Tales to Terrify. They did Unrest. Um, and yeah, they just say, hey, we're going to buy it for audio. And then I hear it when it goes live. And it's it's really cool. It's kind of like seeing your book cover for the first time, seeing that interpretation of your mm -hmm. work. It's just, I don't think it ever gets old. It's very cool. That is cool to have like a cast do that one particular story since it's just mm. those four people. That's, that's right. really cool. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of, I feel like almost all the stories at least have some sort of creature or cryptid or something like that. Did you, or do you have any of your own fears that you've written stories about in this collection? Like, are you afraid of clowns or rats or anything like that? You've <laughs> sort of incorporated it into the stories. It's uh, professional you know, time, yeah. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> well, I don't want to encounter any of those monsters, but my, my biggest fear <laughs> has always been around spiders. I grew up with okay. arachnophobia pretty badly. Um, just terrified of all bugs. I used to like check my room every day for a long time for bugs. Like pretty serious phobia. Um, I eventually just kind of grew out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Although I. Did you really? Or... Oh, well, okay. I thought I did until I found a tarantula in my backyard last year. Um, yeah, no and thanks. that evoked like a special kind of fear. It was yeah. just, you know, giant spider slowly crawling. At first I thought it was a Halloween decoration that had fallen. because it was not... <laughs> Oh my God. But it started crawling. Um, so I just was seized by this like frozen kind of fear and the, 
worry of, oh, what if it jumps towards me? I mean, they don't, they're pretty docile, but but then after the fear, I kind of appreciated it because it was really cool to see. And it was just trying to hide, you know, not a big deal. <laughs> Although I did, I called animal control. Like, you know, what do I do about this tarantula? Because where I live in San Diego, my neighborhood, they're not really that common. They're more common inland. And uh, the guy who answered said, just pick it up, put it in the canyon, you know. <laughs> just nonchalantly. just <laughs> Yeah, very nonchalant. And I don't think that's what you're supposed to tell people to do. But <laughs> Um, I just left it. Anyway, so spiders, um, definitely a fear I've had. And I don't think they really show up in this collection. They do show up in Melinda West as a monster. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for this one, let's see. There's there's ghosts, clowns, rats. I don't think there's any spiders, if I'm remembering right. I feel like yeah. one of the characters on the train story, their version of what they saw at the end was spiders. Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, I think you're right. Thing. I think she yeah, sees we don't really see what she sees, but we hear her. Yeah, she just um, mentions it real quick. Yeah, that's right. Jay, did you like the giant rat in that one? <laughs> Since you love rats and snakes, <laughs> the Rat King. Who did we, who did we get? Was... On, we got on somebody for that. Megan Lucas on somebody we got on for rats or snakes or something. She, I, she's got a story about snakes in the, the yeah, freezer. Yeah, I, I, she didn't give us a warning about just yeah. <laughs> that Jay's phobia, he didn't like it. That's that's my his is eyeballs. Mine is just oh, uh, like snakes freaky. and rats. So, yep, yeah, doing stuff with the eyeballs. Like I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. That's like one big thing. Yeah, I could see that. So <laughs> this collection has like several different horror genres in it, and you you have some of a you know the science background and the you mentioned you know like you like sci fi horror. Mm -hmm. Any of these easier to write than others or any did you find yourself struggling for make any of them harder to write than others since mm. you're all over the world with some of these different genres yeah i think um sci-fi horror in general i would say it's a little harder to write only because i have to do more fact checking right okay. so mm. there's two that are set in space and you know i have to check is this does this planet make sense you know, does this floating space office, like, is it realistic? So uh, not harder in the sense of um, crafting it character-wise or plot-wise, but just in terms of that extra layer of fact-checking, kind of like with weird Westerns, right? Yeah. Kind of sure that everything makes sense for the time period. Mm -hmm. I really like, I think the last one is Peerlings, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll, that one might be my favorite in the collection. I don't know, something oh, about sure. what those were. I don't want to say what they were, but they were, I don't know, they were very, very unsettling. <laughs> mm. so that, that was one where it was um, fully a dream I had, and I just, like, got up and that wrote makes it. it almost, it almost, almost makes it even more creepy <laughs> that it was a dream. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was nice. I kind of wish that would happen more often. You know, <laughs> I've heard that happen other that. Yeah, you just dream it. It's like perfectly intact, and you were able to wake up and like remember the actual dream. Yeah, I'm pretty enough good. To... About, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty good about writing my dreams. I've always had dream journals ever since I was okay. a kid. So yeah, so that uh, yeah, something next to your bed to write stuff, or mm -hmm. yeah, okay. or my phone. Now I'll just open yeah. it up. And take some notes. I just aged myself. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I had a typewriter. <laughs> Did you? Do you get many ideas from your dreams? I think that's that's kind of fascinating like that, where you can actually remember enough to actually turn it into something. Do you dream ideas? That <laughs> you dream ideas. <laughs> I feel like I used to more. I think now I'm so tired all the time. That it's exhausting. <laughs> that may make the stories a little bit weird. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Well, after some night call or something. Yeah. Be real weird. <laughs> Yeah. Just dreaming about work or something that's completely boring and not exciting anyway. <laughs> you know, I usually don't dream about work or like school. People have those school fears, right? I usually uh -huh. dream about being chased by zombies or um, dinosaurs. Last week, I was being chased by a really <laughs> terrifying raptor. It sounds ridiculous, but it was really scary. That'll um, be in the next collection. <laughs> yeah, dinosaur score. Yeah. yeah, I need that. I love dinosaurs. <laughs> I do too, but it was it was a little too scary. That <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, this is released by Dragon's Roost Press, right? That's right. I don't think I've ever heard. Have you heard of them, Brad? 
Have I just not I'm heard of them? I'm, I'm unfamiliar with Dragon's Rich mm-hmm. Breast. So They're how did this breasts. come to be? Did you just, did you send it to them, or did you do you know somebody, or were they looking for? How did this all come to be? Yeah, no, it's it's it actually worked out pretty um, pretty nicely. So there is an annual conference called StokerCon, which a lot of horror authors are familiar with. It's put on by the HWA Horror Writers Association. And um, at StokerCon every year, they have a pitch session where attendees can sign up to meet with agents or publishers. Uh, So that was how I met the editor in chief last year and pitched this collection. And he loved the kind of cosmic weird horror angle. Um, So that worked out really well. You know, something about kind of in-person pitching seems to always yield better results. It's really hard to do Uh kind of the cold calling emails. Um, so I was really happy that worked out. Nice success story from the pitch session. Are they just horror or do they have other like lit? Do they um, them? it's mostly horror, but there's dark fantasy and kind of adjacent. Okay. Yeah. And some of the agents and publishers there, they're kind of more broad too. Like they're interested in horror, but also mystery and other things. So it's actually really nice that you see people come out um, after they pitch and they're really happy because usually, you know, they get a request to at least read the full full piece. Right. Mm-hmm. And who's doing your new one that's coming out next year for your rest? That is uh, Bridgetscape Press. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can never say that one right. I always mispronounce it. I think it. I'm saying it right. I hope I'm saying it right. It might be Bridget's. <laughs> I've always said Bridget's, so. Uh. Yeah, it's got some weird spelling. We should just ask them flat out. Yeah. Steve, yeah. Steve, Steve, right? Steve. 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 Yeah, Steve, Steve and his Heather. wife run it. Steve yep. and Heather, yes. Yeah, and they're so great. They're and they they publish a lot of awesome books. Mm-hmm. So having a novel and a collection, do you when you're writing these, do you approach them differently as far as like your process as for a short story versus the novel, or you just kind of go into it the same way? So for the collection. I didn't kind of write the stories for the collection, right? I had a lot of stories and I thought, let me let me group them in a way that makes sense um, mm-hmm. to make a collection. Whereas I think some people will write stories for a specific theme collection. Uh, but in terms of just writing approach, you know, short stories are very different art form, which I really appreciate. And I like them as kind of a palette cleanser or if I get any kind of writer's block on the novel, just to switch and do something completely different for you know a day or a weekend uh, where you're not losing your thread of your novel, but you can take a break. Um, so I love kind of jumping between the two. Right. Do you find it hard for short stories to kind of try to hit that you know, whatever 5,000, 3,000 word count and not just keep going over it? And- Sometimes. I mean, some of them definitely I thought, well, I could expand this to a novella or something longer, but... I usually try to write to the 1,000, 2,000 word mark. Like that just kind of hits naturally when I'm writing a short story. Um, Mm -hmm. Once I start getting much longer, then yeah, there's the potential to expand it, which is always exciting. The novella I just completed was actually based on a short story. And um, I have other short stories where, you know, maybe someday I'll expand those too. Did you expand any of these from their previous versions for your actual own? collection oh um you know not really but the one story in here better halves about the um mirrors if you guys remember that that's the one that is now a novella um told in three parts over a time period so just kind of expanding on on those creatures and that the history of that house is that the one where they're like at the the bed and breakfast Mm -hmm. yeah okay I would like to see a longer version of that. That'd be interesting. So is it the same same core characters? You just expanded the story? Yeah. So that one is actually, I made it, um, that is part two. So I added a part one where you see how the bed and breakfast kind of comes to be and, and okay. what these creatures might be. And then part three where things um, kind of get more intense and then get resolved. <laughs> okay. I, that one was very once you kind of see what is going on was very kind of like Clive Barker ish, at least it was yeah. for me. That's what I felt that is with the, the building. And I don't want to say what else is going on, but yeah, very kind of Clive Barker feeling for that. Did one, you get I think. Barker out of that? I don't know if I got Barker I out did. of that or not, but okay. 
you probably read more, more marker than I have, but yeah. I don't know. Just something about just the weirdness of it was Clive Barkerish for me. Nice. I like that. <laughs> I like to hear that. <laughs> Tales of the Uncanny. Every time I see the word uncanny, I, I'm, I'm thinking the Marvel Universe. Mm. Just any connection with X Men or anything with oh, that? Or Oh, yeah. I love X Men. Do you really? Is that where the uncanny is? Was yeah, that purposely yeah, like that? Totally. Yeah. I think okay. it's a great word, right? And it evokes X Men, but also, you know, sort of like maybe a little bit of creepiness. Did, did you but, collect comic books? Yeah. Un- oh, okay. That, yeah, that's that's way where I'm too, getting it from. So way too many. I, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't I haven't been caught up uh, recently. Just it takes a lot of time, right, to get the comics. Right. But growing up, I got all of the X Men and all the X Men kind of spinoffs, and just always at the comic book store every weekend. And um, actually, when we moved houses, I had those you know white crates with all the comics right. stacked up and. Um, movers were like talking to my husband about it like oh, why do you have so many comics <laughs> like they're not they're not his they're mine um <laughs> and also like bins of the action figures from that time period right all the x-men action figures they had some really cool ones back then do you mm-hmm. still have them i do yeah okay i i think i sold all mine we were hard up for money one time oh. <laughs> i was like i could tell they got ripped off too but still oh. uh, maybe one day i'll start collecting again uh, enough about comic books. Let's go back. <laughs> Let, let's test. Some, let's do some trivia, Brad. Let's let's uh, let's here. put her on the hot trivia. seat here and do a little uh, trivia here. Did you make All an right. intro? By the way, <laughs> I did not. I didn't have time to make a fun intro, Jay. I didn't. What? Have time, but sorry, Slacker. I failed. We didn't have the budget for it this week. <laughs> All right, we're, we're gonna put you on the hot seat. We're gonna do some uh, trivia here. Okay, I've always been very bad at trivia. So, okay, are you a competitive person? Um, I am, except with trivia, because I'm so <laughs> deeply bad at it. I just get that mind block. Like, even if it's something I know, it's just gone. But So, you know, ba- basically, af- after tonight, you may not be Rebecca's friend anymore for <laughs> for uh, recommending you to the show. Is that what you're saying? Okay. okay. We'll see. <laughs> so, I told you off air that all the questions are related. It's all science fiction TV shows or movies that either are adapted from a book or they wrote something from that into a book. So it's all kind of book related in a way and sci-fi. So would you have to explain it that much ahead of time of the trivia? Well, just, this is not going to go well. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's not going to go well, but it's okay. Maybe right. the audience, audience can help me out. <laughs> all right. Number one, who directed the movie based on the, no- on the novel, do androids dream of electric sheep? Oh, okay. Blade runner, Ridley mm-hmm. Scott, Ridley no. Scott. See, that's not too bad. Yeah, you got it. I, I didn't know it. <laughs> no, did you even know that was Blade Runner? No. No. <laughs> I, oh, it's, I so, it's a classic. classic. I, I know the movie Blade Runner. I didn't know it's uh, the other. I did not <laughs> like. I did not like that book. I thought it was kind of boring, but I do like the movie. The movie's great. Right. Yeah. The movie is great. All right, number two. The TV series The Expanse is based on the book series sharing the same name. Who is the author of the book series? Oh, that one, I don't know. The Expanse what's, what's was it called? on my list for a long time. The Expanse. the Expanse. I think it was on, was it on Sci-Fi? Sci-Fi Channel, maybe? I think so. I watched the first season, I think on Amazon, and I really liked it, but we just never continued it. So I'm going to need a lifeline for that one. On a friend, so I'll say the first, the last name is also a first name if that helps out, and they've got initials in the middle. So it's a name, two initials, Uh, and a name. Have they written anything else? Not that I know of, but I do know it's a pen name. It's two authors under the same pen name. They write together. Oh, you're making it more confusing for me. (laughs) (laughs) It's a name with words. It's a name. A name name with words. (laughs) <laughs> no idea. What does it start with? Uh, first, the first name's James. James. <laughs> James R. R. Martin. James. <laughs> close. It's, it's James S. Yeah. A. Corey. Okay, and that's two James. people. It's two people. It's two guys yeah. writing under the same pen name. Oh, interesting. I don't know why, but that's interesting. Huh. 
Nice. I got to finish that show. It was good. I've read the first book. I really liked it. I need to get back into the series, but I haven't watched the show. But the book was really good. We just finished, side note, just, um, we finished Silo on Apple TV. So now I want to go okay. back and read the books because the, the show was excellent. I read Wool for the first time like a month or two ago and I loved it. It was amazing. Mm, nice. I'm excited to read it. These are these are sci-fi books you guys are talking about? You've never heard of Wool, Jay? Come on now. It's I think it's over here somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, Wool's good. It's It was like came out in like, he was just like posting it online, I think, at first. Just like mm. on blog posts, like in ch per chapter. And they got really popular and he wrote it into a full novel. Hmm. And there's like three books, I think. Is there three? three books. Yep. Yeah. It's good. It's like dystopia sci-fi. It's uh reminded me of the Fallout TV show, if you've seen that mm. kind of same mm -hmm. kind of world vibe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number three. This oh. Chinese science fiction novel was recently adapted to Netflix earlier this year. Oh yes, and I watched it and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> What was it called? Um, I thought the the adaptation was really good, actually. Oh, and I have the book on my bookshelf. Oh, man. I was going to put the author's name on here, but I would completely butcher his name, so I didn't even put his name in here. <laughs> oh, my husband's going to kill me for forgetting this because he, he really liked the show, too. Oh, what is it called? I can picture the cover perfectly. <laughs> um, picture the, the words that go along with the cover. Oh, what is it? It's... um. Oh, can I have the first word? The <laughs> no. <laughs> three, three, three is the next word. Three. three. Oh, three body problem. Yes. Three body problem. Oh, that's on Netflix, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's on Netflix. Is it that came the, out like March or April somewhere around there? Is that the one Brad Pitt's part of? He's I not in it. I don't think so. He he might he's a, a producer or something of it. Executive producer. Oh, maybe. Could be. Yeah. I think so. Um, I've heard it's really good. I heard that the Chinese community got mad because they set the show in London instead of in China. But I don't know if any of that's true. I haven't read the book or seen the show, but it look, it sounds cool. It's very show, like sciencey yeah. sci-fi, right? Like science oh, sci-fi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the kind of deep science, but also creepy. Uh, and man, the end of that first season, you're just like, what is happening? It's so good. So, I need to watch it. I'm always though. I need to read the book first before I watch it. So it always takes me forever to watch stuff. So how many seasons are out? Uh, just, just one so one. far. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if I it was renewed. I hope so. I think it's three books, but I don't think they're super long. It's like 300 pages ish. I think not too bad. All right. Number four, what was the first science fiction film to win the Academy award for best picture? It's come out in 2017. 2017 that's how long it took for a sci-fi to win ouch mm. <laughs> that seems very late okay 2017 um can i google 2017 sci-fi yeah, release google. <laughs> well it's so it's it's also a book so if that helps and, and it won best picture best uh film to win academy award for best picture yes hmm. um can i have a clue of who was in it <laughs> I don't know who's in it, but I'll give you a hint that okay. the creature in this sci-fi film is very close to a creature you have in one of your stories in the collection. Ooh, that's an interesting hint. Um, and we've hmm. had the, it was co-authored the book. One of the authors has been on the show before. <laughs> so if you've really? done your homework. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Wait, we, I don't talked even, about, we talked to him about it while they were, it's a, while he was on the show. I think they wrote the book and the, the movie were like kind of at the same time. Interesting. It's, oh, it's I know love, what it is now, but I can't think of. The, it's not it's a, a love, quiet place. It's a love story. It's kind of a love story. Hmm. So this think of the creature. Think, think of the creatures in your collection. That's sort of based off of a really kind of classic movie monster. Hmm. I believe they're actually on the cover too. I can't even. Look. Okay. I got to look at the cover. <laughs> Maybe I could phone a friend real quick. I, I think they're on the cover. If, um, if that's my interpretation. I'm, I'm Googling it. Oh, okay. Mind. Shape of Water? Shape of Water, yes. <laughs> that was 2017? Yeah. So I thought had, that was older than that. 
the love Daniel story Kurt. part is what it it's like so centrally a love story, right? Yeah. 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 So it was Daniel Krause and I can never pronounce Del Toro's first name. Guillermo Del Toro wrote the book together. Oh, I didn't realize they wrote the book together. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's I was a thinking that was I I thought that was much older than 2017, but okay. <laughs> Number five, which which Arnold Schwarzenegger movie is based off of a story by Philip K. Dick? Ooh, um, came out in the nine came out in the nineties. The nineties. I know Let's that one. See. You know one, Jay? So... It's not do androids dream of electric right, sheep. It's, it's not, not that, that one. one. Um, I'm trying to think of his other popular stories. It's. The man it wasn't named. It's not that one. That was a TV show that came out recently. Um, I'm not that familiar with Arnold Schwarzenegger movies in the 90s. That's a sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Oof. Can I have a can I have a hint for that one? I feel like in the movie they like put him in a machine and like something goes over his eyeballs. Oh, that's right. Okay. What was that one called? Um <laughs> See how bad I am at trivia. <laughs> but it's there and just takes it's there a while just to, to bubble out. Um, Do you know uh, it, Jay? I just want to go with Total Recall. Is that it? Total Recall. Yes. Yeah, Total it, Recall. Was that the name of the book too, though? I don't know if it's the name of the book. I don't think it's the name of the book. Um, that was the name of the movie. And that it's one also, was remade, right? It says, a, it says it's a story, so that might be one of his short stories instead of a novel. Stories. I think that's right. Man, I wish I had phoned a friend because um, <laughs> uh, author here, David Agronoff, he is like the Philip K. Dick expert. Oh, really? He organizes, uh -huh. Yeah, he organizes the Philip K. Dick Festival. Like he would be the one I'd call for this question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number six, Oasis is the name of a virtual reality game featured in what book and movie? Oh, Ready Player One. Ready Player One, yeah. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that book. Um, and actually at Comic-Con a few years ago, they had a walkthrough that was Ready Player One, and it was super cool. They had um, the scene from um, all the different like shots in the movie. It was super mm -hmm. cool. Did you read, have you read the book or not? Just yeah, seen the movie? yeah, I read it. Did you read Ready Player Two? I heard that one wasn't very good. I don't know. I didn't, yeah, because the reviews were mediocre. Um, yeah. Maybe at some point I'll read it, but I thought the first one... I, I get its flaws, but overall, as a reader, I really enjoyed it. It was like a fast, fun read that, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always easy to achieve. And big nostalgia boost, it seems like, for oh, the yeah. 80s video games and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, number seven. The 1973 film Westworld was written and directed by which famous best-selling author? Oh, shoot. I, I know this. Um selling author <laughs> can i have his first name michael michael oh michael crichton michael crichton yep that's right so that was a 1973 know. movie i never the watched the original film. yeah is that what the series was based on too or yeah from H on hbo mm -hmm. okay the hbo one yeah the, I love the theme HBO. park with all yeah i didn't i don't think i've watched the final season but the first two were really good yeah, I really enjoyed that one, especially like opening with the Weird West kind of feel. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. I, that was really good. I really enjoyed that one a lot. But I I didn't see the final one where um, the guy from Breaking Bad was in there. Jesse, I don't, Aaron Paul. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the final he did a good, season. yeah, yeah, it was good. I, I, I like the first season the best, though, just with the Western feel. And it's, and got the, the, it's got the it's got mystery to it, too. You don't know what's yeah. going on. Yeah, it was really good. Number eight, the character Paul from the book film Dune is part of which noble house? Iraqis? Mm -mm, that's the planet. No, that's, ah, oh, shoot. Same, <laughs> starts with the same, starts yeah, with the same letter. Uh, let's see, Iraqis, Arades, uh... <laughs> you, The second one you said is really close. Arades. Paul of, ah. Uh, I can Jay, never you know that? Have you seen Dune, Jay? You know the answer to that. <laughs> it's no. so it's so good. It's so and we actually have a Dune game we play and it has all of the like planets and things, but I'm so bad at the names and the planets. It's like I cannot 
cannot get you're so straight. you're so close it's house atreides atreides with a t you're so close yeah. All right, don't tell my husband I messed that one up. <laughs> <laughs> so the dude, is that like an RPG game, like tabletop RPG you play? Yeah, it's tabletop. We haven't played it in a while, but it's pretty cool because you have different components on the board. You can kind of build up your spices or build up your army, and you have different methods of attacking. It's fairly involved, but it's really fun. Jay, you should play that. We should play together, Jay. We'll stream that, it. That's right up your alley. Isn't Jay's, it? Like, Jay's like, no. <laughs> All right, two more questions. Okay. Uh, number nine, an anthropologist, a surveyor, a psychologist, and a biologist travel to the mysterious Area X in this book slash film. Oh, um, is that the Alex Garland one? Mm-mm. No. Can Can you repeat it? Biologist? Yeah. It's an anthropologist, and they're, it's a woman group. They're all women. It's an anthropologist, a surveyor, psychologist, and a biologist. I believe the biologist, it's all from her perspective. Travel to oh. the mysterious Area X in this book slash film. Who played him in a film? Is it Natalie Portman? Uh, that one. Natalie Portman. And yes. uh, he was, uh, I can't think of his name. Oscar Isaac was in it too, I think. I love that movie. I haven't read the book yet. Um, oh, I'm blanking on what it's called. The book and the movie have the same name. They have the same name. It's one word, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, see, it's sort of coming out of my brain. It's there. You got it. <laughs> Slowly. Let's see. It's not infested. Um, I think it's called uh, the, the, the Far Reach Trilogy, I think. Something like that is what the series is called. Not that that helps you out at all. Yeah, right. It's the Force Shield. Um, Jeff, Jeff Vandermeer is the author. Can I have the first letter of the title? Starts with, starts with an A. A, okay. It's not Ascension. Oh, what is it called? And I love that movie. It's like the end <laughs> is so trippy. Um, Ascension. Look, Jay's Googling it right now. Yeah, I am. Oh, yeah. I got it. Okay. Can I think I, I got, what are, he's, got it? he's got three books to start with the A. Jeez. Okay, it's definitely not Ascension. Mm -mm. Um, can the next letter? A-N. A N A N. Gosh, anybody watching this is probably screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Andromeda. Uh, what else starts with A N? <laughs> it's double N A N N. If that helps. Oh, Annihilation. Annihilation. Does that movie good? I've never seen it. Everybody I really. Says it's really it. Everyone says it's super weird. It's, it's gonna be so better. Good. It's gonna be better than this trivia game. Jeez. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, your questions are great. It's just my brain. It's <laughs> sorry. I'm the same way. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at trivia because I can always. I know what it is, but I can't ever say it. Mm -hmm. All right. Final final question. Okay. Which <laughs> which character from the 1986 film Aliens is the protagonist of a V Castro novel? Oh, ooh, that one. I just saw the cover of that. Uh, <laughs> what is her name? It's not Ripley. It mm -hmm. is, oh, what is her name? She's such a great character, too. Uh, let's see, we have Ripley. We have, uh, I think she's only, in, she's only in the second movie. Oh, Rodriguez. Close. Close. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> it's a Spanish character. It's a Spanish character. Um, no, I can picture her perfectly. She has the bandana. She's awesome. Like yep. she's the one you'd want by your side because she is, <laughs> she, she is hardcore, um, and she doesn't freak out like the other soldiers. What is her name? It's uh, close to Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Ends with a Z. Easy. Easy. It's the name of the book too. I think Aliens, and then the name. Uh, what the book is? Is called. her first name on it too? Uh, no, not on the title of the book. Not on the title. Okay. Um, Rodriguez. I'm just, I'm stuck on that. Her, her first name's Jeanette. Jeanette. I actually never knew that. I don't think you ever find out in the movie. I don't think you do either. No. Jay, do you know who it is? Ramirez? Oh. Mm, no. I'm trying to think. I know. Easy. Right? You said it I know easy. Starts with R. Starts with easy. Starts with a V. 
Oh, oh. B. Oh, um, Banquis? No. Vasquez? Vasquez. Vasquez. Yep. Is that? Uh, why? I was sure it was P an R. Maybe that's a PFC. Character. PFC Jeanette Vasquez. I think the book is just called Aliens Vasquez. Nice. She is awesome. Uh, that book's on my TBR. Excited. Ooh, is that it for trivia? I hope. That's it for trivia. <laughs> You're off the hot seat. <laughs> said, I, hope. I got. I got like two. I think without him. She's, she's right? getting over a sickness, and you're going to do that to her, Brad? Jeez. <laughs> At least it won't show good, but that's the cover. I, you can't see it. Very oh well. yeah, that, that's that's right. Nice. She's got the bandana and stuff on. She's the best. Um, so Casey, well, she'll never come on the show ever again. I know. <laughs> you can breathe. Breathe now. <laughs> I'm not going back to paper cuts because you know. <laughs> uh, at least it was good topics. Yeah, they make me sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Shrouded Horror Tales of the Uncanny. So this is out now with the several different genres of uh of horror without with, throughout the whole thing. Um is there a particular writer or writers that you follow that do that writes horror that you kind of got you into, you know, the rhythm of writing horror. I don't even know where I went with this question. I apologize. <laughs> I started off, started off one direction, but another way, who do you follow? Which writers do you follow? Which, what, who, who do you, who do you read? Mm, you mean in terms of like current modern authors or more? Any. So, so I, I'm guessing you might've got into writing at a young age and kept doing it. And I know, if you were a fan of goosebumps and no, I, yeah. I think yeah. I'm too old for goosebumps, but. Um, Goosebumps is I great. still have I, yeah. I still have all my old Goosebumps books from when I, I was do. a kid. Gosh, I wish I had mine. I'm really sad I don't have those anymore. They're so I, classic now. I hate the new covers when they release them. They're always so ugly. The old yeah. ones are the best covers. My yeah. youngest has some of them, but I never. I I think they came out like I was beyond Goosebumps. So I mm. probably should have. What was the ones that came out after uh, for the older kids? I think Fear Street are those the older yeah, ones? Yeah, I probably should have read those. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a trilogy, I think, on Netflix. The first I totally forgot what my question was, too, by the way. We just <laughs> went off the yeah, there, <laughs> yeah, there was the first street movies. I completely forgot about those. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Sorry. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, no, I think growing up, I actually didn't read a lot of other horror, like some Christopher Pike, but I was really more into fantasy and, like, kind of literary. So I loved Margaret okay. Atwood, um, okay. Toni Morrison, like, just really into those writers who have really distinct styles, right? You read a sentence and you know it's them. Okay. Um, Philip K. Dick too, just, it's like an acid trip when you read him. It's so, so <laughs> surreal. Um, and then I came, I was browsing in the bookstore, Walden Books or, or one of those, and somebody recommended cyberpunk to me, which I had never heard of as a genre. So I started mm -hmm. reading William Gibson and um, his stuff is also so distinct, like his, the way he writes and his use of language is really beautiful. So his, his stuff I glommed onto and um, that was an early inspiration. Um, nowadays I read a lot of everything. I like to read outside of horror too, just to try to stay kind of balanced. Um, but yeah, it's hard now. I think there's so many amazing horror authors and indie authors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't really stick with one. I kind of, right. Cause the to be read list is so expensive right, right. and I have so many books I want to get through. So I really jump around. So were you reading Toni Morrison as a kid growing up? Cause that's some heavy stuff to be read as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, um, I want to say seventh grade is when I started reading it. Uh, and part of it was through school. We, I was really fortunate to have great English teachers. I was in public school, mm -hmm. but I just had really great English teachers and they were really good about giving us a variety of literature to read instead of the same two books every year. Right. Charles so, Dickens and <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Toni Morrison, I was introduced through school and then read all of her other stuff. And yeah, Margaret Atwood too. I mean, their stuff's pretty heavy, but a lot of literature is. And, yeah. you know, as a middle schooler, high schooler, that really resonated with me, those different styles. Mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong. I love Toni Morrison, but I don't think I would be able to handle that as like a sixth or seventh grader. 
yeah, yeah, it's um, it was very eye opening for sure. So do you, do you try to incorporate like any not to like copy their styles or anything, but like take all these bits of Margaret Atwood, Tony Morrison, sort of inject kind of their styles into your own way? Of you know, I wish I, I wish I could, but I feel like they're all so incredibly distinct. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it's sort of hard to imagine incorporating that, right? Like Margaret Atwood has very stream of consciousness too. Um, for me, for my writing, at least right now, my main goal is to be entertaining as opposed mm -hmm. to um, really experimenting with language. And, you know, hopefully I'll continue to evolve as a writer, but right now I'm just, I wanna entertain. So that's part of like the weird Western stories, mm -hmm. the short stories. I'm starting a, a pirate book next. So just kind of a, okay. for me to have fun and like escape from the seriousness of the world, right? But I do <laughs> hope at some point I will, you know, maybe explore more literary writing and experimenting. Do you like sort of like period stuff then? You, you have the Western, you're doing a pirate book. Do you kind of like the, the history, history horror stuff? Not really. I don't know why. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. No. no, I know. It's really strange. I am. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why <laughs> I gravitate towards it, but I actually, I don't get too immersed in the history. And that's part of the fun of like a fantasy Western, for example, right? I just mm -hmm. created my own version of the old West. Um, so there are some like historic pieces that are accurate, but I don't use like any town names or real people. It's like an alternate history. So yeah. same with the pirate world, kind of similar time period, but that gives me like the flexibility I want just to make up whatever, but also having just little flavors of the history. Whereas mm -hmm. most hist historic writing, you know, people are really immersed in the details and that's why you read it because you want to be in that world. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of like borderline fantasy history. Um, and also kind of the biggest thing is I wanted women characters and all of these roles that you don't really see them in. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's my world, so I can do that if I want. So in the Western, for example, there's women lawmakers and gunslingers, and it's not a big deal. It's not weird. It's just the way it is. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's just my own, my own little world. So what the, because I love pirate stuff. Is the pirate one going to have monsters and stuff like these, the stories yeah. do, or is it? Yeah, for okay. sure. <laughs> Plenty of monsters. And, and maybe I'm, maybe I misinterpreted your stories, but I feel like a lot of your characters in the, collection were from the male perspective is that did i am i getting that right not all of them but i would say yeah, from the male perspective yeah yeah for sure and for short stories you know that's part of the benefit right you can explore different viewpoints that you might want to mm -hmm. not want to do a whole novel in um so you know present tense third person first person male female narrators um so yeah some of them for whatever reason the voice just comes out and it's it's a male character um, mm -hmm. but for my novels, I've always kept to female protagonists. I don't, I just found that not that there was anything wrong, but I just found that interesting because a lot of the collections I've read from female authors, usually most of the characters are, you know, it's female from their perspective. Mm -hmm. So I just mm -hmm. thought it was interesting. That oh, that's a good point. A, a generous number of yours were, you know, male perspectives. Just, it was just kind of different. I yeah. Don't, I don't know why. <laughs> I have this internal voice that comes out sometimes and it's just this like old grumpy New York guy. <laughs> and, uh, get off, my, get off my lawn. Yeah. <laughs> I think he needs a story sometimes. So speaking of making... New... I was saying, speaking of New York, a lot of your stories in this one are set sort of on the East Coast. You mm -hmm. said you grew up there. So did, did that influence you as well? Just you know, living there, it's easy. That's to why they're that, full of dread. That <laughs> setting in there. <laughs> Yes, for sure. I would say more so than characters, like the location is really like the piece of my life that's in those. Um, mm -hmm. So I did live in Manhattan for a while as like a broke post-college kid. So you sort of see that in some of the stories, like we're waiting forever for a slice of pizza, right? I mean, who does that? Yeah college kids um <laughs> and then i've been in the situation of like you know two in the morning four in the morning you're waiting for the subway you know it's going to come eventually but it might be an hour it might be two hours and in the meantime you see a lot of strange things 
Um, <laughs> so, you know, New York is a very specific feel. The city is a very specific feel. Uh, and then mm -hmm. Boston is a specific feel. And some of the stories are, uh, take place around Boston. And then I would say the West Coast, there's a little influence there as well. So say all the stories are, are pretty much coastal. I've got one one last story I want to ask you about because I said the Peerlings might be my favorite, but this one might actually be my favorite. And it was maybe the weirdest one, the Puddle of Camaraderie oh. Despair. I, oh. I, I, that was just so funny. I don't know why. I, can you do you remember like where the idea can you came make up? The name that a little one, longer or? too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know I think that's another um, the other one that people seem to really like, and I really liked writing it. Just good. that that's that like grumpy old man voice yeah. coming through. Uh, <laughs> so like it was just one, so it was so different than almost all the other stories. Not to interrupt, I'm sorry. It was just like so different than all the other ones. I don't I just really enjoy that one. Yeah, that one was more like really pushing the weirdness, right? Like here's a really weird situation. It opens with this guy who finds himself as just this kind of melted puddle of bones. <laughs> on the pavement in the city in new york and uh people are just ignoring him right they figure oh it's a stun or something because in new york you have to like block out everything because there's so much going on yeah. so mm -hmm. you see some talking bones on the sidewalk you're not going to stop you're going to keep going um, i love that everyone ignored him that just made it even funnier <laughs> Yeah, so that that one I would say was definitely pushing like the boundary of like how weird can i go and still have like some sort of plot um mm -hmm. That one was inspired by an image of just some bones and this girl looking down at the bones. And that's okay. sort of where it started. Like, what would happen if these bones were like talking to you and asking for help? Um, so <laughs> that was one too, where I, for the ending, I like to think of like afterwards, like, oh, what are they doing afterwards? Being yeah. like superheroes in the city. <laughs> so maybe like a whole. Maybe like a whole novella collection of their escapades throughout the yeah, city. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be really fun, actually. <laughs> like, a, like a ghost was it, is a ghost writer? No, is that his name? Yeah, yeah it's skull, like a skull ghost superhero. Right. Like she's, yeah, yeah, possessed and takes out bad guys. That one was a lot of fun. That that one yeah. made me laugh. That was a good one. Thank you, Jay. Do you have a do you have a favorite story, Jay? While we wrap up. The, the subway one is still sticking with me. Like I, I, I get into those kind of psychological events where you're mm -hmm. like, "What's happening here? What's going on? What's you know?" Mm -hmm. Get to the top. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to say. It's hard. It's it hard to talk about a short story without giving away too much of yeah. it because it's short to begin with. So, yeah, that's a very Twilight Zone. Black it is. Mirror, yeah, that's the, story that, that that's why I brought up Black Mirror earlier because that's I get a kick out of. That's the sci-fi horror stuff I kind of get into. Mm -hmm. I, not so much alien. The techie stuff, but just yeah. the weirdness. Right, right. So. Oh, yeah. I love Black Mirror. That video game episode, I think about that one all the time. Yeah. I don't know if you remember where it's like the fear video game. He's yeah. On a house. Oof. There's there, like the first couple, I, two, first two or three seasons, like every every episode was just so great. There, there's the one where uh, I, we just totally got off on a tangent, but uh <laughs> where they record they re recorded everything with their eyes so they could go back and play it yeah, and yeah that's yeah. how that's how the 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 guy realized that his kid wasn't his because that's right he got his that wife's yeah so good yeah. For, for people watching and listening they're like what you just you just <laughs> ruined an old black mirror episode so well I'll, you, if they haven't seen it by now they'll get over it i know really it's on <laughs> netflix guys so you've been making your rounds you had the event last night right it you have an yes. event tomorrow, and of course, you yeah, know, this yeah. is the world renowned show this, you're this on. This is the highlight. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> so, yeah. what, what, what do you have happening tomorrow? Um, tomorrow is my in person book launch party for Shrouded Horror. It's at Mysterious Galaxy, which is our local indie bookstore here in San Diego, one of a few actually. Um, but, Mysterious Galaxy, I always give a shout out because they support horror authors, indie authors, sci fi, fantasy. Um, they have events featuring authors from across the country weekly, um, and their booksellers are the nicest group of people ever. They are so supportive and knowledgeable about horror. Um, so I'm really excited to have the party there. I'm going to have a cake with the cover on it, which I've always wanted oh. to do. Is um, it open to the public to come out? 
too. It or? is, okay. yes. Okay. So if anybody's listening in San Diego, feel free to come by tomorrow at uh, two o'clock Pacific time. Um, and Tiffany Michelle Brown is going to be my interviewing partner for it. And oh, she's, she's awesome. She's awesome fun. Yeah. 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 So she's we're going to have fun. Yeah. yeah. So Shrouded Horror tells of the uh, Uncanny out now. Highly recommend it by both Brad and myself. So pick mm -hmm. it up. You have a, a ball because it's not just one horror genre in it. There's there's several. Uh, so for those of you that are you know need variety, so yeah. <laughs> if you like monsters and creatures at all, this is like the perfect collection because almost every story has some sort of cryptid or creature or monster or ghost. Monsters and I think cryptids and creatures and rats. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, it's, yourself, a, it's, a great, though, because... it's a great creature feature collection and like uh, casey said they're just fun they're just fun entertaining stories yeah yeah thank you casey we appreciate you stopping by wanting to be part of this show um hope you told to get over your your sickness there she'll, yeah. she'll never no, be no, back no no, no offense but I'm, I'm, I'm glad this wasn't a person no offense so oh, no, totally I, fair <laughs> totally yeah. fair and um yes i Thank you for having me. And so uh, the, the night's still young where you live, so go hit the beach. And <laughs> have fun. I'm probably going to hang out here a little bit, pretend okay. I'm still on the interview. So the children. <laughs> so the kids don't come in. That's your, that's your quiet face. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till your husband put the kids to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Man, that was a five hour interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I'll do. <laughs> All right. Thanks for everyone who's watching, who's going to watch this later, who's going to download it, who's going to share this. We'll share this all around. But uh, pick up uh, Shrouded Horror, Tells of the Uncanny. Uh, Casey Griffin, thanks so much for being our guest this evening. And that's a wrap, Brad. Jay, Casey, yep. thank you for hanging out with us tonight, talking about your collection. It was, it was a fun wave. read. Thank you, guys. You got to do the queen wave. It's fine. Okay. Okay. I do the queen wave. See Love you, Jay. Bye. I know you do. Thank you.